Filho e nome Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Veni, Sancte Spiritus, repletuorum, corda fidelium, et tui amoris in ei signe macende. Emite Spiritum tuum, et creabuntur. Oremus Deus, qui corda fidelium, Sancti Spiritus, illustration de coisti, de nobis in eodem spiritu recta sapere, et de eius semper consolatione godere per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Seres sapientiae. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of the Amen. If today we get through everything that I would like to get through, then we will have seen everything that is the, at least the substance, all of the major points of the first of the six volume uh, uh, work uh, on, the, on the life of Martin Luther. Again, these, the substance of it, all, all the major points, because there is, it's a highly detailed work. And you can, you can find it on the internet if you want to read more uh, into more detail about this. Well, this is probably you know, more than anybody wants anyway. Yes. Uh, as many as we can, because he's such an important uh, uh, figure, such an important uh, historical figure. In the end, we probably we may not might not be able to do it in this much detail, but this first volume has a lot of exact what we talked about about uh, how where his ideas came from, how they developed and many of the important early events of his life. So just because of that, we have to cover this first volume in you know, some detail, actually quite, quite a lot of detail, although you know, not as much as the author himself covers those events. So we'll see if we get through all of it today. Uh, if, we get, if I get through all of my notes that I have today, then we will be at the end of that first volume. So we'll go back to where we left off last time, which was Everything was all geared up for the Leipzig disputation. And first thing to note is that the acts of the debate were to have been submitted to the, university, to the universities of Erfurt and Paris for decision as to the winner, but that was never done. So that was the theory beforehand, is that after they would take the, the transcript, essentially, and send it to these universities, and they would decide based on that who came who came out with the upper hand. But that was never done. That was the idea, though. The final impression made on the minds of the audience was that Eck had borne away the palm. In other words, that he crushed Luther. <laughs> that was uh, everybody who was there had that distinctive impression. He had repelled the often virulent attacks of two adversaries with untiring mental and physical energy and had displayed throughout a more extensive and ready acquaintance with the theologians, the decisions of the church, the fathers, and sacred scripture than either of the representatives of the new opinions. So even just on a, uh, uh, on a level of general knowledge, he seems to have been ahead of them. Of a powerful and imposing exterior, with a strong and sonorous voice, he dominated the course of the disputation by his clear-headedness, his composure and deliberation, whereas Karlstadt, whom you may remember, was Luther's um, partner and his, his, uh, his assistant, you might say, in this debate. Uh, where Karlstadt was too hurried and confused <laughs> and unable to produce the necessary positive <laughs> proofs, and Luther, by his overconfidence, his rhetoric and the habitual violence of his attacks on his enemies gave umbrage to many. So he came across as being unnecessarily nasty. The greatest stumbling block to Luther's success lay in the fact that the principal point, which was to be decisive for his standpoint towards the church, was still, even to himself, as Protestant writers express it, in process of inward development whereas Eck could take his stand on a sound and solid basis. So in other words, Luther was defending a heresy which he himself hadn't even quite decided on the shape of yet, uh, whereas Eck was just defending the 
what the church has always taught, that not only did he not have to make anything up, but it was, of course, very clearly defined what exactly it was he was defending. So, even uh, just with regard to knowing their own minds on these matters, uh, Luther was still shaky. Uh, this principal point was the question of the recognition of the church and her teaching office. Eck succeeded in forcing public statements from his opponent, which would perhaps have he which he would perhaps have still preferred to keep in the background, but which were, as a matter of fact, the outcome of his position. So he, he dragged certain things out of him that were contained, so his, uh, things that were implicit, virtually contained in his statements, in his positions, uh, which, which he didn't want to admit quite yet. He was still, or he himself, again, he himself is not quite decided. He's still a little too vulnerable to say whatever he wants. I remember he's not in, right now, he's not under the protection of his, of his patrons. He's in somewhat distance from them. So he's definitely more vulnerable than he could other, than he may otherwise be. So he doesn't want to say, you know, he doesn't want to be too bold at this moment. Or he's already, he's already bold, you see that, but he doesn't want to go too far. But Eck pushes him to admit things that he doesn't want to. Uh, on the second day of the controversy between Luther and Eck on July 5th, keep in mind, remember this debate lasted days, it was a five-day debate, not like a 90-minute you know, uh, political debate today. Uh, so they each had more than two minutes <laughs> to state their positions, definitely. Uh, July 5th, the question of the exercise of the church's power and doctrinal authority and the condemnation of Huss' uh, erroneous teaching came under discussion. So remember, John Huss was burned uh, by the, um, at the at the Council of Constance for being a heretic. And he was, you know, it's actually, if you want to read about it, Parsons, who we talked, you know, saw him earlier, uh, talking about Pope Alexander VI. Parsons defends the council and the Emperor Sigismund, who gave him a safe conduct to come to the council. This is, typically, you'll see non-Catholics say, oh, there was, there was treachery in the part of the church that he was lured away from uh, from his supporters and brought to the council with a safe conduct, which was then violated because he was burned at the stake there. Well, if you actually read what the safe conduct said, it, it gave him safe conduct to come to the council. It didn't make him immune from any and all proceedings against him for being a heretic. So again, that's this is this is much earlier. This is considerably earlier. Uh, it's very interesting, though. So Parsons talks all about that if you want to read about it. Otherwise, you have to wait until the cycle of church history comes around, until church history four comes around in several years. If anybody here has not been ordained by then, I'm not sure how many years you have to count exactly what, in order to figure out what year that will take place, not what year we'll cover that section again, but it'll be a while. So you can read about it now if you want, or you just have to be patient. But it is interesting. Uh, so, Luther was obliged to express his views on the condemnation of the Bohemian heretics. Driven into a corner by Eck, he declared that among the Hussite doctrines condemned by the Council of Constance, there were some very Christian and evangelical propositions. So, he's putting himself in the very worst company here. Uh, that the council was wrong in asserting that everyone who wished to be a member of the church must believe in the primacy of the papacy that we must learn for ourselves from Holy Scripture what is of divine right. So, you know, we're looking at personal inspiration, or at least hinting at that, uh, that the opinion of an individual Christian must carry greater weight than that of either Pope or Council if established on better grounds. So, personal infallibility here. Uh, that Councils may not only might err in matters of faith, but that they had actually erred, as in the case of that of Constance. So Martin Luther liked SSPX, maybe? <laughs> I don't know, it sounds like he would. Uh, such unheard of admissions cause, caused the greatest sensation, as you would imagine. Uh, blue, uh, the Duke George, whom our author describes as being bluff, must have been quite a character, on hearing Luther's assertion that the Christian doctrines of Huss had been unfairly condemned, exclaimed in a voice loud enough to be heard throughout the great hall, a plague on it. 
So he got he gets up and yells that in the middle of this debate. Shaking, he shook and shaking his head at the same time and planting his hands on his hips. So he doesn't like Luther. Uh, it was an easy task for Eck to disprove on theological grounds the statements of Luther. The disputation had at least the effect of clearing up the position and arousing misgivings in many of those who hitherto had been partisans of the Wittenberg doctor. And this is actually uh, just a general rule that heresies are the occasion for the church defining things. Uh, many things that the church could define but has not defined were uh, that maybe today we wish were defined have never been, never were in the past because there never was a motive for it. Like we were talking a little bit about uh, uh, in Latin class, uh, Fenianism came up, this paracidon. And that's an example of something that the you know, church could define, obviously, baptism of blood and baptism of desire, but never did define it earlier because it was never, there were never enough people denying it to bring about that definition. Yes, today we could use that, but it was just, it was never, there was never a sense that it needed to be done before. But as a general rule, heresies, heretics, uh, are often the occasion of actually certain teachings of the faith becoming more clearly, uh, more explicitly formulated. Because uh, the church can do that. Uh, it's not, it's, there is a, a true sense of the development of dogma. And people, when you hear development of dogma, that immediately rings, starts uh, sets of modernist bells. They like to say things like, oh, we have to develop doctrine. That's, most of the time you hear that coming from modernists, that's bad. But there is a true sense of it. And that is that certain truths of the faith can be, become more explicitly formulated. Like, for example, the, the Nicene Creed is much more explicit, uh, or the Athanasian Creed, much more explicit than the Apostles' Creed, for example. Of course, there's no contradiction between them, or contradiction among any of the formulations of the Creed, which were approved by the Church, because heretics have their own formulations. But there's no, there's no contradiction among different formulations of creeds, for example. But they can become more explicit with time. Like, obviously, filioque was added at a certain point. It was always true. It was always true, but it was added in, making things more explicit at a later date. Uh, so that's that. That is the true development of, of doctrine, development of dogma. That's and, and Gary Gu even says it that that the dogma is not absolutely identified with the dogmatic formulation because that formula can become more clearly defined. But that does, of course, it doesn't mean that. Uh, new truths are being discovered. It doesn't mean that divine revelation is being a public. Public revelation is over. It's not doesn't mean that public revelation is still being added to. It's, it's done. It's just that things are becoming more clear, more explicit, more um, uh, more explicitly proposed for the belief of the faithful. Whereas again, up until the end of public revelation, God did actually continue to reveal more things. The number of articles of faith actually increased. Uh, in that sense, that public revelation is still being added to. But yeah, this is all, you'll see all of this in, in De Revelazione, which is uh, well, extremely interesting. Um, but again, just uh, all of that coming from the statement that this disputation, this debate that they had, at least made things clearer. And then, of course, many times when the church does define something, not only does it not bring about peace immediately, its immediate effect not only is not peaceful, but usually brings about immense upheavals or even or makes things become even worse in the immediate aftermath uh, because heretics, they, they've been exposed, they don't like that, they get very angry, and then they start persecuting the church even more. Um, but of course, at the same time, it has a result of very much unifying those who are remain loyal to the church and continue to adhere to the faith. Uh, and all of that because of this this statement here that he that this disputation made things made things clearer and, and he shot, obviously he shocked a lot of people uh, by his his heresies by showing sympathy not only for his, not only coming up with his own heresies but uh, also for you know, expressing sympathy for heretics in the past uh, okay so Luther himself wrote, in a very discontented frame of mind, uh, regarding the disputation, 
saying that time had been wasted in the useless affair, and that Eck and the theologians of Leipzig only sought worldly honor, and on this uh, everything had sh suffered shipwreck. So essentially, it was uh, it was a waste of time because I lost. <laughs> is what he's saying. Yes. Yes, yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think he. Uh, I think he was. He was a Dominican, as I recall. Probably in here somewhere to find it again. But that's. I only understood that he was a Dominican. <laughs> and again, one more reason why he would not like, uh, why Luther would not like him. Uh, And again, of course, you see, now he's just complaining. He lost, and now he's complaining that the whole thing was a waste of time, and they were just out to make me look bad, and this and that and the other thing. Uh, just, he's being a bad loser, essentially. Uh, only the discussion on the primacy, that is, that very one at which the most momentous admissions were made, had been fruitful and productive, he says. So, essentially, the, the moments in which he caused the most shock, and all, okay, those moments were okay. <laughs> You know, his, his most offensive heresies, you know, or, or at least at least his most shocking, his most sensational ones. Uh, those were those moments were good, but all the rest uh, they just make you look bad, and then, therefore they're they're evil too. And then our author says this is his own impudent way of describing his position as the only right one. Hardly anything else he continues was treated worthily. Eck was applauded. He triumphs and reigns. But an end shall be put to this by my publication. For as the disputation was badly conducted, I shall have the resolutions to the disputation theses reprinted. These people of Leipzig neither greeted us nor visited us, but treated us as deadly enemies. Uh, Eck they supplied with an escort, they surrounded him constantly, honored him with feasts and invitations, presented him with a coat and a costly mantle, rode out with him on pleasant excursions, in fact, did everything imaginable to disgrace us. That's what he says. And take that with a grain of salt. That may be true to some extent that they treated him more nicely. But, I mean, is that any surprise? <laughs> when, uh, you know, when you yourself are a heretic, are you, any, are you surprised that the people who are defending the teachings of the church are going to be you know, treated with more consideration? Uh, that's a surprise to him. Uh, uh, he, he must really be full of himself. Uh, but that's what he said. But again, keeping it, always keep in mind anything he says, his tendency to uh, exaggerate, his tendency to go to extremes. And of course, to throw invective at anybody he doesn't like. He said also, there you have the whole tragedy. It began ill and ended worse. As a rule, I control my ill humor. That's what he says. Uh, but here I cannot help pouring out my grudge. Yeah. What else is new? Uh, because, after all, I am human, and see how the shamelessness of our adversaries and their poisonous hatred of so holy a cause have grown beyond measure. It seems almost like he's attributing his own, uh, his own motives to everyone else. Uh, that's what he said, and just another example of his, uh, his vehemence. Obstinately adhering to his standpoint and embittered as he was by the Leipzig tragedy, our author puts it in quotation marks, uh, Luther would lend no ear to the proposals for reconciliation and settlement suggested by the papal chamberlain Karl von Miltitz. His attempts in this direction had commenced even before the disputation. Their continuance revealed on the one hand Luther's obstinacy and on the other the inability of this lay papal official whose motives were merely political, to see the real seriousness of the matter. The latter, in order to secure apparent victories, went beyond his instructions and the intentions of those who had entrusted him with his mission. So Miltitz is trying to reconcile Luther, but not using the best means to do it. Uh, Luther, on his part, did not shrink from diplomatic concessions which could not injure, injure him, but which anyone conversant with the conditions must have seen to be impracticable. The easy triumphs of which Miltitz's uh, short-sighted love of peace was productive were thus of very doubtful value. So you know, he's, he's making concessions, trying to get him you know, to, to come off of it, but it's not, it's not successful. Luther is taking advantage of whatever concessions he can get, but not giving anything in return. 
So you know, it's just a bad idea for dealing with you know, people like this, is to concede anything because they're not going to, they're so, he's clearly so obstinate, he's not going to cede an inch of ground himself. So it doesn't make any sense that you would give him anything uh, in hopes that he would. Uh, Luther's edition on the Latin commentary, of the Latin commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians, which appeared in September 1519, assumed all the more importance in his eyes. In this work, he undertook to defend on the widest basis and to be four cultured men of every clime his doctrines concerning grace and salvation, faith and righteousness. So as we saw earlier, as, as he mentioned, uh, he was going to, essentially, uh, in response to losing that debate, he was just going to shout his heresies more loudly by means of publishing them, pen, printing them, printing more of it, sending it everywhere. Remember, printing press is now available. So he's able to do that. Yes? Oh, these papal chamberlain? Carl von Miltitz. German name. So here we have a public manifestation, not merely of the doctrines which lay at the back of the schism he had stirred up by his controversy with Tetzel, but also of his own, uh, of his wrong new view concerning Holy Scripture. Uh, by the Holy Scripture, he moreover persists in understanding his own interpretations of the Bible. So in his, we're seeing here uh, personal uh, inspiration, private interpretation emerging. By a tragic mistake, he has come to confound his own personal and altogether subjective interpretation with the objective word of God in the Bible. In the same way, he makes not the slightest distinction between the meaning of the gospel, which he fancies he has discovered, and the actual gospel itself, meaning the accounts given by the evangelists. Of course, his own, as we've, as we've seen before in his own interpretation, it's not just like it's one school among different schools, because there are, there are some passages of Zacchaeus scripture which are difficult. Uh, there, and you might have some d debate about what the exact meaning is, but Luther is just coming up with, he's just making stuff up. He's seizing on passages of Zacchaeus scripture, deciding they mean things that they don't mean, and then extrapolating from that, building his heresies on mm -hmm. his own false notions of what Zacchaeus scripture has he has decided, actually says. That's what he's doing here. He's not truly studying sacred scripture. He's, he's twisting it for his own purposes. In private conversations at Dresden, Luther showed clearly how far he had already separated himself from the church. Uh, this fellow named Emser, I think we've seen him before, made, represent, made representations to him on this score. I told you of it plainly at Dresden, and again at Leipzig, uh, warning you in a friendly manner and begging you to place some restraint upon your zeal and to avoid giving offense, and not to speak of the superstition, mal superstitious malpractices amongst us Catholics in such a way as at the same time to root out all belief and to rob the German people of their faith. So it seems that this uh, Zemsa was actually on his side and telling him to uh, not to go too far, and if you went too far, why'd you do that? Uh, elsewhere, the same Emser explains, a year before the disputation at Leipzig in 1518, uh, and with that, and meaning at, at Dresden also, Luther declared that he cared nothing for the Pope's excommunication and had already determined to die under it. And this, should he deny it, I am ready to prove. So he's really really throwing off all, you know, all notion of submission to the authority of the church. Saying that he doesn't care about being excommunicated and doesn't mind if he dies excommunicated. Uh, so we may take it that Emser is here alluding to Luther's rude answers to his adversaries, who, according to his own story, uh, reproached him at Dresden with the sermon he had preached at Wittenberg under the power of indulgences, some portions of which had already found their way to Dresden, though as yet it had not been printed. There is no doubt that Emser himself was among these adversaries. 
so uh, perhaps actually uh, I'm sure is not in agreement with him. Uh, his, his statement about what Luther said is absolutely trustworthy and shows how untrue the fable was that Luther was animated by the most peaceful of intentions and uh, only against his will was dragged into a struggle which eventually led to his excommunication. So it seems actually this Emser, uh, and he's not somebody who comes up very often, not really would say a major figure, but uh, he's one of Luther's adversaries and uh, is reproving him here and says, I can prove that he said he doesn't care if he's excommunicated. All right, so two elements were still wanting for Luther's teaching. The two which, at a later date, until the end of his life, he regarded as the cornerstone of the truth which he had discovered, namely faith alone as the means of justification and to the assurance of divine favor which was its outcome. Both of these elements were most, or are most closely connected and go to make up the Lutheran doctrine of the appropriation of salvation or personal certainty of faith. So he's now he's so we're so looking here now at the development of how he decides faith is uh, alone is the means of salvation and that as a result of it yes this you have this divine favor you are absolutely certain that you will uh, be saved and of course this survives among Protestants to this day they'll say things like once saved always saved they'll actually say that. Yes. Yes, and then it says, and also the assurance of faith alone as the means of salvation, and the assurance of divine favor, which as its outcome, both of which make up go to make up the Lutheran doctrine uh, called the appropriation of salvation, meaning that personal certainty uh, of uh, of faith. So, in accordance with justifying faith, includes not only a belief in Christ as the Savior. He says, I must not merely believe that he will save and sanctify me if I turn to him with humility and confidence, uh, but that I must have entire faith in my justification. So, of course, we do, and the church, of course, has taught that we have to turn to Christ with humility and confidence. That is true, obviously. Uh, the church has always taught that. But what Luther says is that uh, he, he must have entire, he says, I must have entire faith in my justification and rest assured that without any work whatsoever on my part, and solely by means of such a faith, all the demands made upon me are fulfilled, the merits of Christ appropriated, and my remaining sins not imputed to me, such as my personal assurance of salvation by faith alone. So, again, once again, faith alone means of, means of justification, assurance of divine favor, that goes to make up this idea that you, are, that you have the certitude that you will be saved. And this is not, you know, or of course, faith is necessary for salvation, but not alone, as we've established many times before. Although, an interesting point, uh, there are, we were talking, another thing we were ta talking about in Latin classes, that there are different uh, levels of theological censure. Many times people hear anything, any, any statement concerning the faith, which is incorrect, and they'll say that's heresy. Now, in some sense, yes. But it's not the strict theological censure of heresy. There are there are different levels of it, and one of those is called it's called captious, uh, spelled like this. It has nothing to do with real tits. But captious means uh, seductive of simple mind. So, in other words, saying something which may be in itself true, but which somebody who doesn't know much or somebody who's not very intelligent might uh, confuse for something else. So, to say faith justifies uh, true, but not alone, people, most people who hear that will take it in a Lutheran sense. So, that's, a, that's the example that's given for a typical example of something which is a captious statement, something which is seductive of simple minds. So, when we're talking about these things, we always have to be very clear about you know, explicitly the church's teachings on these things. Now, sometimes you know, Protestants may come up with teachings from the fathers, quotes from the fathers, which may seem to support them in some way. Because remember, the fathers were writing long before any Protestant heresies came about. So they were perhaps writing with a different error in mind, stressing one thing or another. And, and they were, obviously the fathers were 
uh, generally speaking, when, when they're all in agreement, it has to be taken what they say is pertaining to you know, tradition, to divine revelation. But you know, sometimes, you know, one or they were at the same time though they 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 were not infallible. So sometimes you, know, you might find one or here statement here or there which doesn't sound quite right and which may be exaggerated, or you know, or in the case we're talking about here, something they that may just uh, be uh, emphasizing something. Uh, but not not to the exclusion, obviously, of the Catholic teaching. So just keep 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 those things in mind. And if you have, you have to deal with Protestants, especially the educated Protestants. So, of course, the teaching of the Catholic Church never recognized in its exhortation to faith and to confidence in God this existence uh, the existence of this faith alone which justifies without further ado, nor did it require that of necessity there must be a special faith in one state of salvation. In place of faith alone, the church taught with the Council of Trent sums up, we are said to be justified by faith because faith is the beginning of human salvation, the foundation and root of all justification, without which it is impossible to please God and reach the blessed company of his children. So faith is necessary, yes but not in the way in which Luther means it. And of course, uh, talking about the, the virtue of faith, and we'll see what Luther means by faith. It doesn't mean what the church means by that. Uh, faith is the virtue by which we are inclined to give the intellectual assent, right? an act of faith is that intellectual assent to the teachings of the church. And it doesn't have anything to do with feelings. But Luther means faith just as a pure confidence in God. It's, that's all he means by it. It's, it's, it's nothing to do with, uh, with intellectual assent to the truth of the faith. So, if you ever hear anybody talking about faith as meaning confidence in God, just know that that's, that's pure Protestantism, yeah, whoever says it. Uh, and you may even hear sometimes uh, Catholics, even sometimes people who are supposed to be traditional Catholics, <coughs> will sometimes say things like that. And the reason is that, of course, there are significant numbers of people who abandon Protestantism for uh, either for the for the faith or for the Novus Ordo, thinking it's the Catholic faith, but it, it takes a long time to get all of the Protestantism out of their systems, if, if you will. It, it lasts for a long time. It takes years, even decades, for them to get all that stuff out. So as many times you'll see uh, people will say Protestant things that that are actually Protestant. They may not even realize it. They might think that they're Catholics and that they they adhere to the faith. But they still, it's very difficult to give up the, the idea that nobody's going to tell me what to think. That's the, what I've heard, what I'm told, is that uh, for, for people who have, well, I've told about people who have come from uh, Protestantism, who they've said that that's the single most difficult thing to give up, is this idea that I can essentially determine the truth for myself. The idea of this, this intellectual submission and assent to the teaching of the church is uh, very difficult for somebody who's used to Protestant way of doing things. And then, and then of course you have, like you might say that, again, to return to Fenianism, it's almost like, uh, it's like a different, it, it's Protestant in, in, in this way that instead of being free examination of the scriptures, it's free examination of the Denzinger. <laughs> that's, that's what Bishop Denmark calls it. It's a free examination of the Denzinger, which is true. Because just like Protestants will take sacred scripture and decide, to, you know, they'll read it and they'll decide contrary to what it, what actually the God, the Holy Ghost, the, the inspiring divine, the, the inspiring, the divinely inspired author actually meant, they'll decide it means something else and then build a whole system based on that. Well, Phineas will do essentially the same thing. They'll take the definitions of the church and then misunderstand them and then build a whole system based on their misunderstanding. So it's really very, very similar. Okay, so instead of let's see, uh, instead of setting up a special faith in our own state of salvation for teaching, the teaching of the church, <coughs> as expressed by the same council, Trent, uh, had ever been that no devout person may doubt the mercy of God, the merit of Christ, and the power and efficacy of the sacraments, though on the other hand, no one may boast with certainty of the remission of his sins, nor may it be said that those who are truly justified 
must convince themselves beyond all doubt that they are justified and that no one is absolved from sin and justified unless he believe with certainty that he has been so absolved and justified as though absolution and justification were accomplished by this faith alone. So by justified here we mean somebody who's in the state of grace. And of course, yes, it, it's true. I, I mean, I'm surprised I haven't mentioned it yet, but uh, the author hasn't quoted it yet. But of course, there are definitions of the church saying that, yes, we cannot have, uh, without a special uh, revelation from God, you cannot have the certainty that you will be saved. That there, there, are, there are certain signs of predestination, through which if you have all of those, you can have a certain moral certitude, but uh, a metaphysical certitude, a certitude that go so far as to you know, ex exclude any other possibility to the contrary, uh, can only be had when with a special revelation of God. Okay, it says, instead though, uh, everyone, uh, bearing in mind his own weakness and indisposition, may well be anxious and afraid for his salvation, as no one can know, with the certainty of faith with, which excludes all error, that he has attained to the grace of God. So, <clears throat> Luther, after forsaking the Catholic doctrine, had hitherto been tormented by anxiety as to how we can be assured of the grace of God. So, here he goes, making things up again. Uh, having left the secure footing of the church's teachings on the nature, grace, and predestination, he was, now a search in, uh, uh, he was now in search of a certainty even more absolute. His commentary on the Romans had, had concluded with the anxious question, who will give me the assurance that I am pleasing by uh, that I am pleasing God by my works? Well, we can pretty surely say that he's not. That he's in fact not doing that. But you see, this is, is one strange thing that again, it's not uncommon in people who tend to be scrupulous is that they'll be scrupulous in some things, but then very lax in others. You know, some some people will become so scrupulous in everything that they abandon all uh, essentially all scruples, even in a good sense and just do whatever they want, no matter how sinful it is. But some people are scrupulous in some things, but very lax in others. It's also not uncommon phenomenon. They probably have some idea that, essentially, uh, I'm making up for my sins by, by being very strict in, in small things. Um, so, but it, but it, it applies here uh, in, to, this, in this, to this extent that you know, he's, he's, he's very anxious about uh, how do I know that I'm pleasing God by my works. Meanwhile, he's coming up with all these heresies and saying horrible things about the Pope and saying, I don't care if I die excommunicated. But at the same time, he's worrying, am I, or am I, how do I know that every single one of my works is pleasing to God? So, as yet, he can give no, give, give no answer other than that. We must call upon God's grace with fear and trembling and seek to render him gracious to us by humility and self-annihilation, because all depends upon his arbitrary will. Uh, in, these in these lectures, in the course of his gloomy and abstruse treatment of predestination, he had instructed his hearers how they must be resigned to this uncertainty concerning eternity. Remember also he has this idea that some people are predestined uh, uh, to hell, at the, which again, is not the Catholic teaching. And this he learned, or you know, what, what, what we were just talking about, uh, that they must that his people have to be resigned to this certainty or this uncertainty concerning eternity. Uh, he thought he learned that uh, through his doctrine of assurance of salvation through faith. Uh, so basically, in his system, either you're definitely going to heaven or you're definitely going to hell. You know, in, uh, you know, there's one or the other, uh, and you either be predestined to heaven, of course. Catholic church, Catholic teaching is that you, there are some who are predestined to heaven, but he also has this idea that you're predestined to hell, which is false. So, so again, he just, he just says you have to be resigned to uncertainty. That's the end result of his system. Uh, forgiveness offered us by God in his word, if we may anticipate here his later teaching, uh, became for him a definite object of sanctifying and saving faith to the extent that faith came to be identical in his eyes with fiducia. So again, going to this. Fiducial faith, uh, with, his, with its assurance of salvation, was the way which Luther discovered out of all of his troubles about two years after the termination of his commentary on the Romans in 1518, 
or beginning of 1519. That, that's when he came up with this idea. So if you do Chia, say 1518, 1519. That's how you spell that. Yes. Yeah, this is. Oh, this is this is when he. Uh, well, it's a couple of years after he finished his commentary on the Romans, on the Epistle to the Romans, and that's 1518 and 1519. So it's at least we're seeing it in his. Uh, he's come. That's when he's at least airing his ideas for the first time. Uh, so this discovery is a remarkable event which stands alone and with which we must concern ourselves after first examining what led up to it. Uh, from the place where it was made, in the tower belonging to the monastery, it might be styled the tower experience. So if you hear of the tower, Luther's tower experience, this is what we're talking about. Uh, his state of uncertainty with regard to the appropriation of salvation caused Luther great disquietude. Other circumstances, particularly his feverish excitement, at the outset of his public struggle, also contributed towards his inward unrest. The morbid fear of which he had never rid himself was also powerfully stirred. So again, he's still he's still suffering this anxiety and, uh, over his salvation. I mean, he's got reason to be worried about it, <laughs> but not for the for, for the wrong reasons. Uh, it must also be more. It must also be borne in mind that the monk, or of course by which we mean Luther, uh, with his pseudo mystical ideas, cherished a gloomy conception of God and held to the terrible doctrine of the absolute predestination of the damned. So again, contrary to Catholic teaching, uh, having wandered away from the Catholic teaching with his views on man's lack of free will and the theory of arbitrary imputation by God, uh, he found no answer in his troubled conscience to the question which weighed him down, namely, how to arrive at the assurance of a gracious God. So confusion and inter interior pangs of conscience for a while gained the upper hand. So he's having the anxiety attacks again. And then also his uh, peculiar morbid tendency to fear, you know, which we've seen a result of you know, some of his own ideas bringing this on himself to a degree. Oh, probably had a natural tendency to it, but his ideas aren't helping him. Uh, must be taken into account for it afforded an opportunity to the tempter to add to his confusion by raising difficulties concerning the deficiencies of his new self-chosen theology. Uh, and then, uh, an author, Adolf Hausrat, one of, the, one of Luther's biographers, uh, speaks of a, a periodical mental disturbances from which he suffered during the time he was a monk. Uh, and you know, though actually our author, you know, Grisar, Father Grisar, says that uh, that there's uh, it can't be proved that he ever actually suffered from any mental illness. Although I'm a little surprised to read that because you definitely would think that <laughs> because some of the things he said and did would be an easy way to explain it. Uh, so the disturbing power inherent in the uh, says in the monastic practices again. This is this, this house house rot, uh, author house rot, uh, says that uh, disturbing power inherent in monastic practice, whatever that means, uh, took possession of his sensitive nature with its strong feelings. Uh, Luther only escaped the danger of going mad by, bra by bravely bursting the fetters of the monastic rule under the popish faith. So this is a clearly, you see which, which camp <laughs> this author is in. <laughs> Wrong one. <laughs> Hopefully you know, I didn't have to explicitly mention it. <laughs> uh, but I say essentially trying to justify Luther by saying that uh, essentially the, the monastery was killing him, so he had to, therefore, he has to defy the faith in order to overcome it. Because clearly he didn't enter the monastery willingly. Uh, okay, so in the strong inward combat which Luther endured at a later date, the same author, Hausrat, uh, recognizes a return of this affliction. So that may be, he may be suffering from the same anxieties that he suffered earlier. Uh, in, 
in his second edition, he has toned down this view from, of Luther's periodical attacks of mental illness out of regard for the objections which he had, uh, which, which, he, which had been urged against his statement. Uh, but again, our author, this, is one, this is the point at which our author says that in Luther's case, there's no reason for assuming any monkish mental disease, nor can he be proved to have suffered any, from any uh, disturbance whatsoever of his mental functions at any time of his life. That's what our author says. But if we take it so that the, uh, uh, the night of the soul which he passed through, and of course, you're not necessarily, it's not to be taken in the sense that you read in the spiritual authors, someone who's truly advancing in the spiritual life, uh, uh, whether in the monastery or uh, during his later struggle, had at its basis a peculiar disposition revealing a, a want of uh, normal inward stability, uh, then we can perhaps easily explain some other strange and at first inexplicable phenomena which his case presents. So there was something wrong with him, even if it wasn't necessarily a you know, mental illness that could be diagnosed, like our author says, there's something wrong with him. Uh, so at any rate, the, the fundamental new dogma, yeah. meaning heresy, uh, of the assurance of salvation was not the product of a clear, quiet, calm atmosphere of soul. <coughs> uh, because remember, because he was always so anxious and everything, always so worried about his salvation, that what I mean, somebody, somebody more normal with those problems would be told by his spiritual director to consider the mercy of God, uh, consider how Christ became man to die for our sins so we could be you know, washed clean of them and, and finally actually be saved when we you know, die in the state of grace after having taken advantage of all of the means necessary uh, for salvation. But again, being a man of extremes, uh, he not only uh, considered those things, but uh, he started making up heresies with regard to them and uh, pushed things much too far in that direction. It was born amidst uh, unbearable inward mental confusion and was a frantic attempt at self-pacification on the part of the Wittenberg doctor whose active but unstable mind had already left the true course. Uh, essentially what we just said. That it was uh, like a self-therapy that went wrong. Uh, it is of interest and helps us to reach a right understanding of the tower experience, which we'll see. Um, so we have time to get to it today. Uh, to follow the change of view regarding assurance of salvation, which is apparent in Luther's statements and writings in the latter months of 1518 and beginning of 1519. So he made an appeal to a general council in November, and a, a conjecture was called in December 1518 uh, that the Pope might be Antichrist. You know, just casually throws that out there, uh, were momentous indications that he was cutting himself adrift from the authority of the church. Although that probably didn't come as a surprise to anybody given the things he had said uh, up until that time. Uh, at the time, uh, he stripped uh, the ideas he had hitherto held on faith of everything that reminded him of the traditional teaching of the church. He transformed uh, the faith necessary for justification into a mere act of confidence in the merits of Christ without any reference to the sacraments, to other truths of the faith, or to the church, who is the guardian and mouthpiece of faith. So again, he, at earlier times, he did insist that there was some the necessity of the sacrament of penance, but uh, he's getting rid of all of that from the system now. Uh, to lay hold upon the righteousness of Christ with a sure trust is made to suffice for justification and for the fullest assurance of salvation without any of the preliminaries and conditions on which he had formerly insisted. This act too, he holds, uh, God alone operates in man who himself is, devo is devoid of all free will. So again, he's envisioning men as essentially being robots. Uh, although he incidentally clothes the act of confidence with love, whatever he means by it, uh, and even hints at the good works a man may have performed previous to this act, also requiring good resolutions for the future, yet these are the only additions which are really inconsistent with his idea. Henceforth, fiducial faith uh, appears to him as really an isolated fact, an act of confidence inspired by God merely from his good pleasure and with no regard for any work. A vast change of a far-reaching consequence had taken place in Luther's conception 
of the appropriation of the justitia dei, so justification, uh, he had now reached an interpretation of the words justus expide vivit, of the whole meaning of the gospel, upon which, uh, notwithstanding the independence of his treatment of doctrine, he had hitherto, never hitherto ventured. Uh, so we'll continue with this next time. Tomorrow. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Sub tuum presidium confugimus sancta Dei genitrix nostras deprecationes et ispicias in the necessitatibus. Sera periculis cumpis libera nos semper virgo gloriosa et benedicta. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.